uh, give us some food for thought, some things to chew on as we prepare to uh, move on from the study of this, but we'll never move beyond the reality of this. The truth is that, that if a church is going to be a church of the Lord Jesus Christ, then this has got to be bullseye center. Disciples who are committed to be disciple makers, who make disciples in a fashion so that those become disciple makers, etc., etc., and so on, and so on. Um, Look at Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. It's a passage very familiar to you. Um, a lot of years ago, before I was even here, there was a, an emphasis by the a previous pastor to challenge the folks to become an Acts 2 church. And that means something. And this was the focal passage of it. And, and you, don't, you can't talk about this topic without coming back to this time and time again. This is the... Uh, essence of the early church. I want to ask you to stand with me, if you will, and I'm going to read Acts 2, 42 to 47. What is the result? Jesus dying, rising again, ascending, sending the Holy Spirit, coming down in power upon the folks in the upper room, coming out of the upper room, preaching the gospel, God adding to the church, so that this there was this burgeoning mushroom effect where you look up and suddenly thousands of people have confessed faith in Christ and become followers of Christ. Here's the result. Here's, here's what it looks like. 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the, the proceeds to all as had any need. Any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who who were being saved. It says, The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God, if we will hear it, it will teach us. If we will submit ourselves to it, the Spirit will birth it into us and make it work out of us to be what Jesus said we must be if we would be called his disciples. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we, uh, we bow before you and we we confess what we've just sung. We know that when we take a serious look at our sins and ask the question, what can wash these away? The answer is nothing. The short answer is nothing. But the rest of the answer is but the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we're grateful for the full answer, grateful that we're not left hanging with nothing. And we know that as a result of being washed in the blood, sins forgiven, declared not guilty and accepted as righteous in the sight of your throne, as followers of Jesus Christ, that if we're going to be the people you call us to be, then we must abide in him as he abides in you. Help us tonight to, to bring into focus the things that we've looked at now for these, uh, these four or five months. I thank you for those here tonight who have hung in uh, to the end of this. As you've given, given them perseverance uh, in this study, I pray that you'll give them perseverance in life to finish out the course well. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. Be seated. This may come as a surprise to you, but, but demographics show that since the late 1950s, membership and attendance in America's churches have been steadily declining. That's 60 years. It's been declining. In fact, 
those who study these, these kind of statistics and the data and the trends and graph them out say that since that time, up until now, the steady decline has resulted in 80% of the churches in America plateauing or in state of decline. Simply because they want to hang on to, to forms and methods and ideas that may have looked like they worked for a season but were missing because at their heart they did not have this matter that we've been studying for these many months. The thing that I've told you back several years ago now, the command of Jesus Christ hiding in plain sight. <laughs> Make disciples. Now the good news is that in the midst of this decline there's a new enthusiasm among folks for getting back to the to the basics, getting back to the things that matter, getting back to what that looked like uh, in Acts chapter 2. You may have heard this little uh, adage, methods are many, principles are few. Methods may change, principles never do. I want to tell you a story real quickly. Of why, why is that important? I went to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and the founder of Southwestern was B.H. Carroll, Benadja Harvey Carroll. He was a great man of God, a great preacher, great theological mind, had, a, had an incredible mind. His, his brother told the story of coming to see him one day in his study, and he was, he was poring over a text, and he said to his brother, he said, I think his brother was J.M. Carroll, he said, would you go uh, down the hall and you're going to come to a bookshelf, and on such and such a shelf, so many books over, you're going to find a book entitled such and such. Would you go and look at that and turn to page so and so and see, second paragraph down, does it say this? <laughs> and his brother said, I went exactly where he told me to go. I found the title of the book he was talking about. I opened it up, turned that page, and he had cited it verbatim. That's an incredible mind, folks. Spurgeon had such a mind as well, we're told. Well, B.H. Carroll was the founder, and... and God blessed his ministry at First Baptist Church of Waco. He blessed his, his ministry at Southwestern, birthing a seminary that, that for a season, when I was there, was the largest evangelical seminary in the world. And as he was leaving, his health was failing, the torch was being passed. He passed it to, to an evangelism professor who was his, his uh, apprentice, really. B.H. Uh, Carroll had tutored him and raised him up for this purpose, and his name was L.R. Scarborough. L.R. Scarborough was a wonderful man. B.H. Carroll's theology was solid. He could stand in this pulpit and preach, and you wouldn't bat an eye. He, he would bless you. And he had imparted that to L.R. Scarborough. L.R. Scarborough was a very gifted preacher, in fact, more gifted than even B.H. Carroll was. And his students were just enamored with his, with his power in preaching, his capacity, his communication skills. <clears throat> And as he led the seminary, and as he began to pass off the scene, it was discovered that his, his students had latched on to his evangelistic methods, which were, which were influenced, if you can understand, appreciate the time, influenced by, by uh, Finney and uh, Finney, we won't go there, but Finney was, was not solid theologically, one of the principles of the Second Great Awakening, and took, went off the beam on some things. Um, and Scarborough was impressed with Finney's methods, and he incorporated some of the methods. Well, what we found out was that Scarborough's students latched on to the methods rather than the theological core of what Scarborough believed, and it was the methods that were carried forward. And if you know anything about church history, you'll know that there was a big debate around the Second Great Awakening called the New Measures. Uh, Charles G. Finney, uh, Asa Hale Nettleton uh, countered him. Finney was an orator. He was, a, he was a, an attorney by, tr by training, uh, just would bury Asa Hale Nettleton in the debates they would have. But Asa Hale Nettleton held the old line theologically. And so, so Finney's methods caught on. And then theology, truth, doctrine was kind of lost in all of that. Now, why do I tell you that? Because methods are many. <laughs> Principles are few. 
Methods may change, but here's, here's the thing. When, when people latch on to methods, then they're unwilling to turn loose. Of the, they don't want to change them. They believe, well, this has worked, this has worked. And a very, a very interesting pragmatism takes place. Well, this worked for so-and-so, and it worked back then. It worked. Methods may change. Principles never do. And what this call to disciple-making does is it calls us back to basic principles. And that's what I've been trying to communicate for these several months. I want to just really quickly rehearse, just remind you, summarize the four uh, phases. The first phase is the come and see phase. We're going to put this up on the, so you can see it. Um, in that phase, Jesus extended an invitation to five men, remember, to become his disciples and expose them to the nature of ministry. We saw that in the early portions of John. He gathered them around him, cared for them, and exposed them to God's power and message. At the close of this four-month introductory period, he turned their eyes toward the harvest and sent them back home to fish. His teaching strategy was to tell them what was involved and why this involvement was necessary. So it was a, so let's come and see. I'm going to show you this on a graph in a few minutes. Then the come and follow me phase of ministry. It was a 10-month period. We talked about these things along the way, you remember. He extended his second invitation to the fishermen by the Sea of Galilee, an invitation to fish for men. You'll remember that the early part of Mark. And the seeds of Christ's teaching had, had time to germinate, take root, and grow. And when he chose these men to come and follow him, he demonstrated his interest in training them. First was exposure. Second was uh, beginning the in-depth training. His teaching strategy was to show them how to do it and then do it with them. We talked about that at the time. Watch me. Watch me do it. Learn from that. Then do it with me. And then you do it and I'll watch. Then take somebody else and get them to watch you do it. That was, that was, his, was his model. Then the, the come and be with me phase, the third phase, was a 20-month period. He chose the 12 during this time and gave them special responsibility and authority. And you remember, we will go back, that the, that the five he encountered, and, the, and, the, and the, they, they kind of ultimately make up, most of them make up this 12. Gave them special responsibility and authority. He made plans and made it clear to pass his work on to them, preparing them for their responsibility. He sent them out in twos, uh, spent his time demonstrating, explaining, uh, experimenting with them, clarifying what was on his heart. He, he goes beyond the teaching of, of the truth. Almost, I'll be careful, not goes beyond teaching the truth, but he, in, in addition to teaching truth, he begins to share his heart with them. His strategy was to let them do ministry and then deploy them into their own ministry. And then the final phase we've been looking at here, the, the remain in me phase of ministry, the, where he commissions them. We've been looking at John chapter 13 verse through 17, this passage where, G, where Judas leaves the room. And when Judas leaves the room, when the betrayer walks out of the room, then Jesus began to pour into him these folks, uh, this, this last um, bit of material that only John records. This is before he releases them. Uh, they're now deployed to their full calling. Remember in the, in the high priestly prayer, I have finished the work you gave me to do. He hadn't died yet. But this phase of the work, he's finished. The commission doesn't signify the end of the relationship, but a change in the relationship. The Holy Spirit would now lead them, and he tells them that'll be better for them. That's a kind of a summary. Now I want you to just let's look at something real quick. I'm going to take you back to the discipleship wheel, real-life discipleship. I don't know how many years ago now, but several years ago. And I don't know if you can see that clearly, but let's look on the outer rim. And, and we've, we've got another version of this which locks into the, these four phases. But, but this share idea of come and see, uh, the connect, come and, and follow, the train, come and be with me where you, where you walk along with them. And then abide or remain, the, the releasing. And you remain in him uh, according to what he's taught in John 15. And when, when he sends the Spirit, the Spirit will abide in us and will abide in him. And so you see that, that wheel there. People move. If you look at the inner wheel, to come and see. We invite the dead to do that. And when they're, when they're born again, then they're infants. And, 
and we see them move into childhood and young adulthood and parenthood. And so you see how that all works, and you can, you, I hope you have your own copy of this. We've passed out, but if you don't, we'll get you another one. It's important you have that. Now, I want to give this to you in a little different look. This is more of a flow chart look. Look at this here. Come and see. There's that, the different things. Inviting to worship, special events, into our homes, come and eat with us. Oh. Beginning to find an opening, a connecting point, an entry point, if you please. Uh, fellowship groupings, different ministries. Uh, so there's a connection there. As this is developed, as people show an interest, remember we talked about that, where you just walk with them, when they stop, you stop. When they start moving again, you move. But if they finally just turn around and go, then you move on to someone else. You don't, we don't have time to chase. Then the come and follow me, that, that second phase. This is, this is really the heart of it. This is where uh, small groups, life transformation groups, uh, become, become an opportunity to, to grow. Growth groups, whatever you want to call them. Uh, getting to emphasize glorifying uh, God. Which is the chief end. It's why, why he made us. Glorify God and enjoy him forever. And we talk about those, the prayer and, and the word and obedience, fruit bearing, joy, loving others. And you, you see that this is what we've been discussing. And then the come and be with me phase. Where you begin to, you, you're, you've been together, you're cultivating leaders now. You're, you, you're thinking in terms of replacing yourself. Uh, it seems strange to you, but from the first time I stood and preached as your pastor, I've been thinking in terms of replacing myself. And different people we've, we've uh, invested in. And Norman Hare preaches here as, a, as, as an example or fruit of my, my effort to replace myself. I've never wanted to be seen as, as the mouthpiece of Bethel, but rather try to be a faithful disciple, equipping other disciples to equip other disciples. And so you, you think in terms of the training, uh, releasing people, I know some pastors, you may know people like this, who are, they're so insecure and so jealous. They don't want anybody else to preach in their pulpit. They don't want anybody else to do any, any major teaching. I just, I'm just not that way. Number one, I'm not that smart, okay, that I feel like that what I have is, uh, is to be guarded. In fact, I don't have anything original, okay? Everything I've got comes from the Word and the Spirit taught me, and so it's, it's all public domain stuff. Because um, he's teaching other people the same thing. This idea of apprenticing. So you start thinking in terms of who... Who could replace me? If, if all, think about this, if all the leaders at Bethel preaching, worship leading, Bible teaching, deacon, women's ministry, preschool, if, if all of us suddenly dropped dead together, what would happen? Have we prepared for that eventuality? Come and be with me. That, that phase cultivates an environment for that to happen. Now you, you, uh, you're moving through this and it, you notice the arrows flowing that at every point, at any point, come and see, come and follow me, come and be with me. You can connect to ministry teams inside the church body and labor teams in the community or ministering within and without. Loving, uh, loving others, serving the world. Always funneling that. And then the fourth phase down there, remain in me, is the, is the, is the release phase where you in, encourage people to go into their, to their Jerusalem. And we're going to ask that question in a few moments. What, where is your Jerusalem? What is your Jerusalem? Make disciples. And it begins all over again with that person. That is, that's just a good little uh, graph that I came across that I think is very helpful to let us see this process. Because you see, becoming a, when you were saved by grace through faith, whether that was a month ago or decades ago, that was the beginning of God's plan, unfolding plan for your life. 
You, you simply got on the path. It's, if you know Pilgrim's Progress at all, you know that, that uh, Pilgrim flees the city of destruction. Hands over his ears. Oh, I've got to go. I've got to find life. He encounters different things along the way. He comes to Evangelist who says to him, because he's got this great burden on his back, he says, I need help getting this burden off. He already talked to one or two people who told him I could get it off and it was impossible. It, it wouldn't work. It gets worse and worse. And so Evangelist says, do you see the wicked gate? Do you see that small gate in the, in the distance? He said, no. I said, do you see the light? I think I see the light. Walk to the light until you see the gate. When he enters through the gate, and he, and he makes his way around and comes to a hill where there's a, where there's a cross. And there's an empty tomb at the bottom of the hill. The burden falls off. We, we sing a hymn. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. And the burden of my heart rolled away. That's taken right from imagery in Pilgrim's Progress. It rolls down into the empty tomb. Now he is, he is delivered from his burden. And he begins the journey, the, the, the Pilgrim's Progress, the journey of, to the, to the uh, celestial city, the world that is to come. Well, that's, it's a process. You see, <clears throat> I have had people say to me since, since we talked about life transformation groups and we've been doing this study on Sunday nights and we've, when we've done life groups in the past, well, you know, this is just another program. <clears throat> now, I want to be kind and cordial, but I want to pound and jump up. And, no, it's not a program. Discipleship is not a program. If it's a program, then we finish it. We check it off. We move on to the next course. No, it's a process. It's a process. You see, you, you engage in the making disciple process when you encounter a person and share the gospel with that person. When that person comes to faith in Christ, then, then the process of disciple making is underway. In fact, we've taught you in the past that you, you have complete liberty to approach that person and, and expose them to truth in the way of Bible studies and worship and Fellowship, knowing that their heart is still darkened, it's not captured by the word, but those are the means we use to see a person come to faith in Christ. And when they do come to faith in Christ, then they can, as babes, begin to grow along that wheel. You see, one of the things I think has happened, and I think you see it in the, in the over 40 crowd, is they've, as they've been exposed to different things, that they looked at it as a program, and they figured, well, I've graduated from that. Brothers and sisters, I've told husbands through the years, you never graduate from 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands, get to know your wives. <laughs> you never graduate. You don't say, well, I've got that. Uh, no, you keep, uh, that's, a, that's a course. I'm, I'm 40, 42 years in. I'm still in Karen 101, all right? I mean, I just, I am. And I, I, don't, I, I thought at some time in my life I'd move to 102 or 201. But no, it's 101. It's a pretty complicated course. And, well, it's the same way. You never graduate from discipling, disciple-making, until the Lord calls you home. You see, I, I get to quit getting to know my wife in a godly way, along biblical terms, when I die or when she dies or when we both die. Because when we go to heaven, we're going to have a whole different relationship. I get to, how can I, I, don't, make, I don't say I get to, but, but my my challenge, my command from the Lord to quit being a disciple comes when I die and go home to glory because then I will know as I'm known. It's a whole different arrangement there. But on this earth we never outgrow it. And I think, I think that, there, that there's a, a group and it's not just this group. I think that's across the board. But I, what I find is that younger adults are more open to the idea of a process whereas older folks have been plugged into programs. And so when you, when you announce something, the, a new phase of ministry in, in, in designed to intensify disciple-making, they yawn at it and go, oh, another program. How long is it going to go? No, it's not this. This never was designed to be a program. It's a process. So the church needs to be looked upon as a, as a whole unit, um, a living organism, it's, it has a heartbeat. It beats the heartbeat of Jesus Christ. And it's designed as an instrument uh, to, to make disciples. It's not an organization. It should be organized, but it's not an organization. It's an organism. 
And then we should ask the tough questions. Anything that does not fulfill the purpose of making disciples needs to come under scrutiny. Time is so short, and I, and I feel that more now than I did even 11 years ago. Time is so short that we don't have time to in, involve ourselves in something that's not does not flow out of or point to this notion of making disciples. And so that means we need to think in terms of a process. And what does it look like? Well, I want to uh, tell you about a story that showed up in Rolling Stone recently. It's about Kevin Durant. A lot of people are upset that Kevin Durant left the Oklahoma City Thunder and went to the Golden State Warriors where he is, the team, he's one of like four MVPs on this team. And why would he abandon Oklahoma City? And even recently when they played, some guys on the bench were, were jawing at him and saying some unkind things to him and he, he responded in an unkind way. Okay, so, but when you dig down, this was fascinating to me. In that article, they asked Kevin, why? Why would he leave? He was a superstar in Oklahoma City. He, was the, he and Russell Westbrook looked at it as the franchise. His answer was that he wanted real friends, not work friends, not just work friends. He wanted real friends. And the Warriors seemed to offer that. Isn't that interesting? Multi, multi, signed a two-year, $54 million deal. He could have probably coaxed that much out of Oklahoma City if he'd have stayed. It wasn't about the money for him. It wasn't about the money. It was about friends. Now, I tell you that because I think that deep down in people that you and I encounter, and it simply remains for us to discover how to touch that. But that's what people want. People who are interested in church go from church to church because they want real friends, not just church friends. They want people who will listen to them, love them. And the good news is that when we get serious about disciple making, that's exactly what we have to offer. In fact, I want to, I want to introduce you to a term Reciprocal living. What do you mean reciprocal living? If you take your, your, your electronic Bibles or Bible programs and do a search for the phrase one another, there's a, this is a whole study here. There's at least 22 of them that I've found. One another. And we're not going to take the time tonight to read through all these. I, I want to I I kind of tease you with this. We may come back at some time in the future and study through these. We're to love one another. We're to receive one another. We're to greet one another. We're to have the same care for one another. We're to submit to one another. We're to forbear with one another. We're to confess our sins to one another. We're to forgive one another. We're not to judge one another. We're, we're not to speak evil of one another. We're not to murmur against one another. We're not to bite and devour one another. We're, we're not to provoke and envy one another. We're not to lie to one another. We're not, we, we are to build up one another, to teach one another, to admonish one another, to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We're, we're to be servants to one another. We're to show hospitality to one another. We're to pray for one another. We're to use our spiritual gifts for one another. And there may be some more. <laughs> That's 22. Reciprocal living. One another living. We've got it in our, in our purpose statement. We're to follow Christ by loving God and loving others. You could, simply, you could say loving one another because it's implied in that. Reciprocal living is a, is a lifestyle that's anchored in the New Testament's instructions for living in Christ's family. Thinking, what? More highly of who? Others than we do ourselves. The one another's. What we do, what we don't do, so that harmony, we, we talked a little bit about this last week. Unity. 
may be preserved. Well, it means that we commit to one another. Here's the deal. See, if there's not, if there's not another in your life, and I don't, uh, see, I can't count. I mean, I say, well, I got Karen. Okay, wonderful. I need to have Karen. But, but see, that's not enough to practice disciple making. Yes, I need to disciple my wife, but, but I, I can't hide behind that. If there's not another in my life, then I'm not engaged in the one another call of the gospel. Disciple making, intentional disciple making, forces you to think of others. Life transformation groups forces you to think of others. I've confessed recently to my LTG partner uh, when when schedules have thrown us a curve and we've not connected, and I said, I need to confess something to you. It is too easy for me. To go on. I need, for my own sanctification, for my discipline, I need to connect. One another. Reciprocal living. I want you to look with me at 1 John. We don't have this on the screen. You're going to have to turn in, in your Bible. Ask a couple of questions here. Can we be rightly related to one another if we are not first rightly related to God? Look at 1 John 5. Verse 1. Now I'm going to give you, the, I'm going to read this in terms of the verse, of the verb tenses, so you get the flow of it. 1 John 5, 1, everyone who is believing that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who is loving the Father is loving whoever has been born of him. Can we be rightly related to one another if we are not first rightly related to God? Now hang on to that and look at 1 John 4, 7 and 8, because the next question is, can we be rightly related to God if we're not rightly related to one another? 1 John 4, 7, 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever is loving has been born of God and knows God. And anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Do you see the wheel there? You say, well, where do I jump on that, Pastor? Well, anywhere you want to, because you see, if you're, if you're going to love one another as you ought to love one another, then you're going to have to love God. And if you're going to love God as you need to love God, then you're going to love one another. It is inevitable. It's inevitable. Our purpose statement ought to jump out at you. Follow Christ. How? By loving God. Loving others. It's Jesus answer to what the greatest commandment is. And Jesus basically said the commandments are so great you can't give an answer, just one answer to one commandment. You love God with all of your being. You love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's, it's loving God, loving others. So how do we live out these reciprocal commands? Well, again, it can't be done in isolation. It can't be done if we're not intentionally, proactively looking to, to engage and get to know another, one another. I would encourage you to read 1 Corinthians 12. We're not going to take the time to go through this. And I would read 1 Corinthians 12 about how important this is. And think about, okay, what means could I employ... You see, if we really believe disciple-making is a process, then we don't sit back and say, well, I... I wish the church would do something. No. What do I need to do? I've told you about uh, Booth, the commander of the, of the Salvation Army who was scheduled to give a big talk in, in the, up in the Midwest years ago. and <clears throat> Transportation was challenging. He was hindered from making the engagement and there was a huge crowd gathered to him. The place was filled with thousands of people. And all he could do was send a telegram that he was not going to make it. And so, so the uh, MC for the program got up to the podium and said, we have 
disappointing news, uh, General Booth will not be able to be with us tonight. He's been hindered. Oh, you can hear the just disappointment. He said, but he did send us a telegram. So he opened the telegram. And on the telegram was one word, others. He read it and said, this is his message to us tonight, others. <laughs> well, initially there was, you could tell there was, uh, the report that was given was there was kind of a, a puzzled disappointment. It's, well, why? Couldn't he have said more than that? <laughs> Couldn't he have telegrammed us a charge? Wouldn't he? And, as they, as, and you could tell that the crowd sat there, and the more they thought about it, the more they thought, this is so much like him. His whole ministry has been about others. And he was calling them to think of others, to put others first. You see, when you think of others, there are things that your, that your native capacity which will tell you that you're hindered in this and that and shy about this and hesitant about this, but when you, when you think of others, it overrules that native capacity, that native inclination. Because others means we get out of our comfort zone. Others means that we, that we go beyond doing what comes uh, easy for us, natural for us, normal, whatever word you want to put there. Others, and that's, that's, the, that's the beauty of a life transformation group. It's the beauty of small groups. It's the, it's the beauty of disciple making. Is that it forces us to deal with the very heart of the gospel as it's, to, as it's designed to change us so that we love God and we love others and then ourselves and in that order. And then we think about the platform. So, how can we do that? Well, we have exposed this congregation over the last several years to, to disciple making, beginning with the discipleship wheel to show that this is, a, this is the process and it never stops because once you, once you reach parent capacity in your own journey, then you, then you are thinking in terms of investing in one who will be birthed into the kingdom as an infant and you walk with that person or persons through that and then you, then you mentor them and you encourage them to grow. You see, it's, it's, a, it's a wheel because it never stops till we get to glory. We introduced small groups. Not out of desperation, but really out of the, the inevitable working out of, well, if we're going to do this kind of life, then we need to do it in a smaller setting than than. Uh, and congregational worship because it's, it requires dialogue. It requires time spent with one another. And uh, as those began to devolve into another an emphasis on the study rather than on the on the relationships, the one another relationships, then it then we've backed away from that. That's why we're here on Sunday nights now and not in small groups. And challenge one another to to get into a smaller, even smaller cluster of two or three in the life transformation groups. All designed to get us moving on the wheel. All designed for that. And that's where you look at Acts chapter 2. Folks, if you read Acts, do you realize what happened? Pentecost comes, Peter preaches, 5,000 are converted. Have you ever thought about how they managed that? In fact, a few days later, several thousand more are converted. Now granted, some of these had come uh, for the season of Passover to Pentecost from other parts of the world, and they went back to their homes. But many did not. Many stayed there. Their lives were transformed. There was a sense in which they couldn't go back because they would... They weren't the same person they were when they left. And so they stayed in Jerusalem, and the whole, the whole New Testament is written about trying to feed the church in Jerusalem and care for them. How did they care for them? First of all, they didn't have a meeting place. The, the thousands, and our, our text we read said, and the Lord was adding daily those who were being saved. So it wasn't just like a two-off two phenomena. It was growing. It was growing. Why? Because these new disciples were doing what disciples do. They were telling others, and, and then they were being brought to faith in Christ, and it was just growing and burgeoning. 
But have you ever thought, about how did they manage that? Well, they didn't manage it with large meetings. There wasn't a place for them to meet. Mercifully, there were, there were 11, and then tw a 12th added, Matthias added, uh, apostles <coughs> who had been discipled by Jesus and equipped to be disciple makers who were, who were managing these, these people in groups. Otherwise, this thing would have died on the vine. If they had needed a large meeting place to go, it would have died on the vine. You see, Acts 2 tells us that all these new believers uh, continued. They remained. Their come and see experience was showing up uh, on the day of Pentecost in a crowd and when this strange phenomenon occurred and it was like cloven tongues of fire fell upon those coming out of the upper room. And there's, a, I can imagine a guy from uh, Parthia who hears Peter preaching, knows that he's a Jew, he's probably got a Jewish uh, uh, dialect, but he's, he hears him preaching in his own language. But Peter didn't know Parthian. So he recognizes there's a miracle taking place. This guy is preaching, but I hear what he's saying is communicating to me. And so this, this crowd is gathering. That Their come and see experience was right there. And they, many of them moved that day from, from come and see to come and follow. Tell us more. We want to know more. Jesus had told them, he said, you're going to see greater things than, than I have done. There it was on Pentecost. Jesus, the greatest preacher in the world, never saw 5,000 people come to embrace him on one day. And there it was. Come and follow me. Come and be with me. They, they were building relationships. They had, a, they had to engage these people. When they did not say to them, well, come back next first day of the week. <laughs> no, that didn't happen that way. Couldn't. And it was the, it was the commitment to... to to intentionally go one another with these groups that the Lord blessed. So whatever you call it, home fellowship, life group, life transformation group, disciple making 101, whatever, whatever moniker you put on it, see that's the, the label is not as, as critical as the, as the function is. How do I Get into the life of another. You see, when you study the scriptures on this, particularly the Gospels, and then some of the epistles in the book of Acts, you, you see these four things. God loves sinners and desires that sinners be saved, or as one writer said, that the lost be found. Jesus said that. That's why he's come, to seek and to save that which was lost, and sent us, had we been there, on the Mount of Transfiguration, he would have said to you and to me, as surely as he said to the 500 that Paul said was there, <clears throat> go and make disciples of all the people groups. But we also recognize, we were studying through John 15, that he, he, he desires the development of these people. It's not, R.F. Gates used to talk in terms of, he said, Bill, he said, most, many, too many people approach evangelism as sort of a step over the line thing. Just, well, there, I did it. R.F. would say, it's not, a, it's not a stepping over the line. It's a stepping onto the path. It's a stepping onto the road. It's, it's engaging, beginning the journey. Becoming a follower of Christ is as it is, it's, it's the entry ramp into becoming a disciple maker. He wants his church, we read from Ephesians 4, to, to cultivate a unity, to be one, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father, to be equipped to do the work of the ministry, to grow up and mature, 
So that a lifestyle, this reciprocal lifestyle that we see in, the, in, the, in our text in Acts, not only did they continue together uh, in the apostles' teaching, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the koinonia, in that true, uh, what Kevin Durant's looking for and doesn't necessarily realize it, real friends he calls it, that true fellowship, that, that, that shared life, the breaking of bread, whether that's speaking of what we celebrated today in the Lord's Supper, or whether it's a, whether it's a table fellowship where we, where we invite people in to share of our means. Because there was a lot of that going on, you know, in the early church. These folks had come on a, on a Passover pilgrimage. They didn't plan to stay there. <laughs> and now they need to eat. They need to sleep somewhere on an extended basis. And the prayers, because this, you, I promise you, these apostles who'd been praying in the upper room for a lot of different things, probably praying for their protection, that they would not be found out, that the authorities wouldn't kick the door down and haul them off like they had <clears throat> Jesus and nailed them uh, to a cross, been praying for the, Jesus said, Terry, in the upper room till you be endued with power from on high, and praying for the power to fall, whatever that looked like, praying to be faithful. And when they, when they saw the fruit that God gave them that first day, I promise you they were praying, Lord, we don't know how in the world we're going to handle this. What, what are we supposed to do with all these people? Help us, Lord. They were the prayers, the times of prayers. And we're talking about a group of people now that this was not convenient. None of this was convenient. Their meeting times were not convenient. It wasn't convenient to plan. It wasn't convenient to participate. Stated times of prayers, the prayers, were not convenient to, to plan or participate in. Because they were not driven by convenience. They were driven by conviction. That just as Jesus had loved them, that they were to love one another. That Jesus, as Jesus had sent them, that they were to engage in the lives of converts so that they could be sent. This Acts 2 lifestyle. Let me speak real quickly to a few things and wrap this up. You see, when we look, when we take a couple of steps back from these four phases, what we realize is that we're looking at the purpose of the church, the product of the church, and the plan of the church. So the purpose of the church, you know, we have stated it, is to, is to follow Christ, love God, love others, serve the world. I want to read you another one that I came across. I think this is, is good, but I think it also, it, it's an, sort of an expanded statement, but it fits right in with what we're pushing here. To glorify God by making disciples who reproduce, training leaders who multiply, deploying equipped ministers into the harvest field, starting with our Jerusalem. The purpose. We say it, follow Christ. We're, I mean, that's, that's two words, but I'm, that's a mouthful. We've spent the last several months just looking at passages of Scripture, at the model of Jesus as a disciple maker, all tied into following Christ. What's it look like? And I wouldn't even pretend to tell you that we've exhausted it. To love God. 1 John 5, 1. <laughs> to love others, 1 John 4, 7 and 8. And, and, the, and the cycle, the cyclical nature, nature of that. Love others, serve the world. Because it's only by serving others are serving one another that we're going to build relationships. You see, there was a time, and I remember it growing up. We, we had a revival meeting. I'll put quotes around it. And we had Buddy Dow and Bill Glass come as the evangelists. Bill Glass was a member of the uh, Cleveland Browns, as I, as I think I remember that right. And I think Buddy Dow may have been a Dallas Cowboy. And we had a, we had, we went to the park. We had hundreds of kids. The invitation was come and play football with Buddy Dial and Bill Glass. And they set up two teams. But I mean, there was like a hundred and something kids on each team, you know. There was a time when that sort of attractional, hey, get on my team. There was a time when pack the pew night uh, was effective. Oh, it was short-lived, short-sighted.
Because what it built into the culture was that, that you've got to have a bigger dog and a bigger pony next time. And you've got to have a bigger boom. And your fireworks have got to go off higher and longer than others' fireworks. You see, it's well intended. None of it, none of it evil because it gave a place, a safe place and a clean place and a wholesome place. But it, but it was not getting down, barreling down to disciple making. And so that leads me beyond the purpose of the church to the product. What is the product of the church? What is it we're supposed to produce? It's disciples. Disciples who want to be disciple makers who in turn have a growing desire and a sense of equip equipping to make disciples and speak into them and see them cultivate that desire to be disciple makers. That's our product. I think it was maybe in J.D. Greer in uh, Summit Church, South Carolina. It's the first one I ever heard say this. I'm sure it's not original with him. He said it's not so much the, the seating capacity of a church is not as important as the sending capacity. And the real question is not how many members do you have, but how many disciples are being made. The product of the church. And then the plan of the church is what we've been going over these, these past several months. Come and see. It's easy. We're going to in introduce you to something in January. It's not a program. It's just another part, another part of the puzzle of the process to make evangelism so simple and non-threatening to you. And we will challenge folks in January to participate in this weekly, and we'll, we'll, we'll cultivate that. I'm not going to tell you all about it tonight, but just look for that. And a good format that speaks to our culture. Come and see. Come and follow. Come and be with me. Remain or abide in me. That's the plan. So let me close asking these questions. In the light of what we've looked at, all, and, all, and, I, and I appreciate you hanging in there, because clearly uh, several people have not hung in there. It, all it does and, and is it proves that in too many places there's not an appetite for this. How will you make disciples? That's a question I want to ask you. How will you make disciples? How would you help, I ask myself these questions, how would you help people grow and mature? I'll tell you this, that once we, once we watch the uh, simulcast next Sunday, we're going to back away from Sunday evening gatherings for a while. And my intention is to speak into the lives of our neighbors around us who we uh, saw, we were able to, pass out about 200 gospel tracts this past Monday night. As John Piper exhorted uh, in an article I read recently, he said, the mission field comes to your door on this night. <laughs> and they all took candy, but do you know something that was interesting? Nobody, n not in front of me at least, put the track down. I didn't find one tract in the yard, littering the yard, and I've got no reports that folks tossed the tracks as they walked. I don't know what they did with them when they got home. But my friend R.F. Gates used to say, Bill, this is a stick of dynamite. Just plant it. We don't determine how long the fuse is. God's the one that's sovereign over the fuse. All we have to do is plant it. Give it out. 200 tracks with a gospel message on them. Tied to the season. And so we want to follow up on that. You know, once again, and then we're not, not, certainly not boasting about this, I just get tickled about it, when the kids would come up and we would give that full-size Hershey bar that we started doing a few years ago. Oh, wow! Look, Mama! <laughs> and we heard from our grandchildren that kids in the neighborhood were talking about our house a few days before the trick-or-treating experience. So we want to seize upon that. We want to speak into their lives. We want to say, come and see. We want to invite them in. 
And in looking at people's schedules, Friday night doesn't work for folks. Too many things going on Saturday nights. Not typically good. Certainly challenging for me. Sunday night, though, when they pretty much have been down all day and they haven't gone anywhere to worship and to simply say, come over. Come and be with me. Come and see. And to see how the Lord will use that to let us build some relationships in one another's lives. Another question, how will you, how will you cultivate new leaders? It is one of the tasks of a leader. I've said to our deacons through the years, you ought to be taking, when, you, when you're going doing deacon visitation things, you ought to be taking a young man with you. So I want you to go with me. Let him taste ministry. Teachers, same way. All these ministry aspects. Look around and say, who can I draw in? Because remember, that's right to do as a leader, but it's also touching somebody who, is, who wants a real friend, who wants to be connected. And how will you identify your people's giftedness? And coach them to use their spiritual gifts. We want to introduce to you a spiritual gift quotient. Some people are down on those, but you know something? A good one is better than nothing at all. Because I submit to you, there's a lot of people that you, in fact, I may, you may not here tonight know what your spiritual gifts are, but there's a lot of people in the church that don't understand spiritual gifts. And so what happens? They're hesitant to do anything because they don't feel like they're qualified. And yet if we can, if we can release people and let them see, look, look how the Lord has put you together. What a blessing He has made you. And cultivate that and stir up the gift. And then the final question. We're going to close. Where's your Jerusalem? We all have them. Probably none of us in here have the same one. Where's your Jerusalem? It's the place you're in most frequently. It's not... Isolated. My wife would say, well, I'm, I'm home with grandkids most of the time. Granted. Beyond that, though, and I'm not going to discount her speaking into the lives of the grandchildren and cultivating them and discipling them and praying over them and blessing them and modeling for them what the love of Jesus Christ looks like. I'm not discounting that at all. But beyond that, where's your Jerusalem? Think about it. Think about the connections you have. That you take for granted, maybe. You just, you're in and out of them all the time and you don't stop and realize, wait a minute, by God's providence, that's my Jerusalem. And then when you identify it, invest yourself in it. We've taught you in the past to look for a person of peace. It's a term that our missionaries have taught us. When they go into foreign lands, pagan lands, where there's not the predisposition of the gospel, they're looking for a person of peace. They're looking for someone in a village, someone in a community that, that accepts them on the basis of what they know about them and doesn't, uh, won't, won't hunt them down, <laughs> won't, won't immediately torch them and torture them. A person of peace. Look for that. Who, who, who's a person of peace the Lord has providentially put in your path? There's a lot of peas there, but they all, they all mean something. Find that. Say, okay, Lord, what one another do I need to express to this person who seems to be receptive of me, if not my message, of me? Because remember, folks, one of, the, one of the things we've taught you through the years is, is you know something? People will never be impressed. They don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. And when that comes across, then they will make the connection that we are the way we are because of what we know and what we believe. And if they see us caring for them, then they will want to know what it is that we know. It's that, it's that order of things. Okay. That's my summary of the last several months. I hope I haven't overwhelmed you tonight, but it just seemed to me that those things were necessary to come together, to package together, to let you see that this is, this is my understanding. If you hadn't understood it before, that's my understanding of what I think we've done here. 
<laughs> the last several months. Let's talk for a few minutes, why don't we, before we go tonight. Any comments you have?